Asanteni sana kwa kuwa pamoja nasi kwenye uhusiano wa imani. Obrigado por sintonizar a Conexão da Fé. Gracias por sintonizarnos en la Conexión de Fe. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection, where we help you connect to God. How many of you were a part of VBS this week? Amazing. That's awesome. Had such a good week. I want to give a shout out to Miss Teresa Roper. She was the winner of the van challenge. So, Miss Teresa, how many people did you bring? About 30, 40, she said, right? <laughs> 30 or 40. I'm just kidding. So, congratulations to her on winning that. How many of y'all saw me stand up here and look like a fool with my tongue out and my thumbs up? So the thing is, I have a watch that's smarter than I am. And while I'm standing up here, my watch begins telling me, Melissa Jacobs is live on Facebook. I'm going, oh. <laughs> so then I say, hey, Siri, tell Melissa Jacobs, turn your phone off in VBS. <laughs> so then it starts saying, Melissa Jacobs has tagged you. So-and-so has tagged you. And now all of a sudden I get videos and pictures. I'm getting videos while I'm still up here looking like a fool. And my, my watch is telling me, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun in VBS. Uh, it, I, can't, I, always, I can't help but think of the VBS where we did the exact same thing here with uh, Treasure Island. And at this point, it was time in the night, and I was the lead actor, and it was time in the night for Smee to do his uh, swinging from one ship to the other. So we're in here, and we're putting up a ladder, and we've got a rope, and we're all ready to go. And about that time, Brother James Cook walks in, and you know, he's got some candy. How you doing? How you doing? And he says, uh, what are you doing here? What do you got this rope here for? And I said, we're going to tie this to the ceiling, and I'm going to swing across. Give me that rope. Give me that rope. I said, oh, are you some kind of like rope master or something? You know how to tie knots? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm good. I got this. All right. Cool. Yeah. Good, great. Thanks for the help, you know? So we hand him the rope. Not a thought in the world about it. So I come back a few minutes later. Uh, he hands me my peppermint, you know? And I said, uh, all right. So we're ready to try this out? Yeah, let's give it a shot. But you got to remember, we're up in the old auditorium, and the, the ships were coming off like where the orchestra pits were. So they're pretty high up. I mean, it was probably a good, I mean, the older I get, the higher it is, right? So I was up there a good 10 feet. And so I give a good tug on it, and I look down at James, and he's got a peppermint in his mouth. All right, here I go. So I jump off that thing, and it was boom. The rope falls and hits me in the face. And there James, oh, it didn't hold, did it? <laughs> didn't hold. And I do, <laughs> just roll. I couldn't breathe for minutes. I'm just laying there purple. And James, give me that rope. <laughs> give me that rope. No, sir, you will not be holding on to this rope. This rope is not for you anymore. This is my rope, all right? I, uh, as I was laying there on the floor, I thought that was payback for all the times I gave trouble to our youth leaders. Oh, man. I, I was thinking last night about some of the times that we had. The time that we went to the teen camp, and they had this big, fat dog that just sits out on the porch all the time. You never see the dog move. It just sits there and, ah, and slobbers, you know. And so, at one point during the week, we decided it was a great idea if we took this dog and we put it into our youth pastor, Chris Webb's SUV. So, that night, um, we snuck into his cabin, which was probably a bad idea. We unlocked his doors, and then we took this dog and we just stuck it in the back seat. And we thought, you know, he'll come out in the morning and see the dog and it'll be just hilarious. How was I supposed to know it had stomach trouble? I mean, <laughs> you talk about angry. That man was angry, and rightfully so. And yeah, so I mean, so I'm laying on the floor, I can't breathe, and James Cook standing over me, and I'm thinking about all the trouble I gave our youth pastors. One of the most fun ones was uh, we were at a teen camp, 
that every morning, about 7.30 in the morning, they get over this microphone, and they called it the silver voice. It wasn't silver, it was annoying. So every morning they get on this silver voice, good morning campers, it is now 7.35 in the morning. Breakfast starts in 25 minutes. Make sure you rise and shine and give God the glory. And they're just constantly, every morning, and you gotta figure it's middle of the summer, you're a teenager, and that thing made me angry. I'm not talking about it woke me up. I'm talking about I would wake up livid. Like tell that guy to shut up. I can turn an alarm on, you know? And every morning, so finally, me and a couple of the guys, we said, we're going to teach them. Like, they're not going to continue screaming in our ears every morning when a simple shake would do, you know? So I started doing some investigating, and I paid this guy in the kitchen, this Hispanic young man, to tell me where the silver voice originated. So that night, about 3 in the morning, who was part of that? Raise your hand. Where's Chris Deer went? Yes. <laughs> Who else? Raymond? I think Raymond would know. My brother somewhere? Okay. So about three in the morning, we have walkie-talkies. We have cameras. I mean, this is the real deal. They have a, a person in every room, so we had to wait till he was asleep, of course. So we go out the back door. We sneak around. We find the place that the Hispanic man told me that this thing would be. And I get there, and Chris is outside with a walkie-talkie, and my heart is beating. And it was at that moment I realized I had not rehearsed this. So I did what every good sound guy does, and I go, testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. And I wait, and there was nothing. So I say to Chris, Chris, did you hear anything? No, I heard nothing. I said, okay. So then I flip a switch on the wall. Testing, one, two, three, te that's it, that's it, that's it. I was like, okay, 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 what do I do? I have no idea what I'm gonna say. So I look at my watch, it was 325, and I said, good morning campers, it is 325 a.m. Breakfast starts in about five and a half hours. Four and a half hours, breakfast is starting soon. And remember, Smokey Bear says, only you can prevent forest fires. <laughs> That's what came out. And then I threw it down, and I ran out the back door, and all of a sudden, the lights are coming on. <laughs> oh, no. Where's Chris? Chris is gone. Might as well just turn off my walkie-talkie and go for it. I get back to my room. Chris is nowhere. We have no idea. To this day, I think Chris hid in a tree all night long. <laughs> I didn't ask. I felt too bad. <laughs> Believe it or not, the next morning there was no silver voice. <laughs> no. There was nothing. It was dead silent. Everybody woke up. Everybody was a little bit dreary-eyed, a little bit tired. People were walking around real angry like... Some of the girls were saying, yeah, we were taking showers at like 3.30 in the morning. So I feel like the Lord just was getting me back for some of those times. But I have to say that I have some of the most wonderful memories. And I'm not just saying that because my dad's the pastor. I'm saying that because my life is built around this church. I mean, everything we do is built around church and uh and it really is the most wonderful memories. And they sing this song, The Lighthouse. To some of you, you're thinking about, you know, a lighthouse on an ocean. But to us, this was our theme song as we started this church, The Lighthouse. And, uh, and it's just great memories. I mean, just phenomenal memories. And uh, oh, I don't know if I should tell that one. Just, just good times. So, I, I'm a little bit nostalgic today. I'm thinking about our pastor's been gone, and I uh, can't wait for him to be back. He'll, they'll be there this coming up week, and then through the next Thursday, and they should be back um, that Thursday or Friday of the next week. So keep them in your prayers. Keep my mom in your prayers. God's doing awesome things in our church. God's doing awesome things in my family. He's doing great things in, in the life of my mother, who's been very sick for a long time. I was telling a few people this the other day. Um, they said, so is your mom doing better? Is she doing better? 
And I said, the best way I know how to describe it is that I can't remember in the last, you know, five years a time that we would go out, have a good day, and then the next day we could do the same thing. Like, that doesn't happen. We may, she may have a good day. We may go out for a birthday or something of that sort, but the next day we always know she's going to pay for it. And, uh, but we spent the weekend with her and just seeing her three days in a row, and I'm sure we pushed her to the limit, but she just hung with us and was happy, and we went out to dinner, and we had a good time and uh, celebrated my dad's birthday. And uh, it was just honestly, um, it's just a miracle. I mean, that's all I can say is it's a miracle and that God's doing wonderful things. But keep her in your prayer. She's not out of the woods yet, but she's doing phenomenal. God has big things for us. Can I tell you all a crazy story before I get started? Just, a, just something. I tell you that God's doing great things, but sometimes it's hard to put it all into perspective, okay? So I'm going to tell you this story. It's kind of wild. You have to hang with me here. But, uh, but it's just perspective of some of the incredible things God's doing. So you all know Miss Judy Franklin. Um, Miss Judy Franklin had a friend um, that she's been witnessing to now for five years. So for five years now, she's been witnessing to this lady. Three years into this friendship and her witnessing to Miss Deborah, um, a very traumatic thing happened in her life. Um, and, and not to go into the whole story, but she ended up in the hospital. And at the hospital, uh, they needed her to get a ride home. And so there was a police officer there. And the police officer was to give her a ride home and, and take care of her. So the police officer takes Miss Deborah to her house. And, you know, do you need anything? Can I help you with anything? You know, gets her to the house. So he begins checking up on her. And one day, as he stops by to check up on her, it was a Sunday evening. He said, what are you doing this evening? And she said, I'm going to watch a church service from my friend Judy. My friend Judy, who's been witnessing to me for three years, I watch her church service on Sunday nights. So the officer said, well, let me sit down with you and watch this church service if you don't mind. He watches Lighthouse Baptist Church, our church service on a Sunday night. He watches it. He gets excited. He said, hey, this is phenomenal. This church it believes like I do. They're preaching, you know, strong preaching and salvation. And, and I think I want to take this live stream and begin watching it myself. So he begins taking that and showing other people how they can watch. And many of you know how the story goes from here. People begin getting saved and, and, and baptized and follow through. And, and people are getting into church. And now, and now lots of people are getting into church. And the, his son begins leading people at school to Christ. And the, and the principal gets saved. And people are starting to get saved. Now it's, it's over 100 people have been getting saved from this man who's watching the live stream. All the while, he's keeping up with Miss Deborah who is still watching the live stream, but Miss Judy is still witnessing to her. This has gone on for five years now. This past Wednesday, I got a phone call from Miss Judy who was just in tears of joy and said, you won't believe it, Miss Deborah, the person that this all started from, she has been watching the Sermon on Hell and she just talked to your dad and this past Wednesday, she accepted Christ as her savior. <laughs> Add to it, the officer who was helping her, he was also watching the stream for Vacation Bible School this week. And on Friday night, they had over 300 people watching the live stream. And with our services and their services combined, over a, is 120, 123 people accepted Christ as their Savior from Vacation Bible School. You can't make this stuff up. You can't make it up. And it, I just, it's just so awesome to be a part of it. It's so awesome to be a part of this church. It gets me excited. I love it. I, uh, I think it's funny that um, as I was back here working in VBS, I noticed that the two guys who were having the most fun in VBS were not kids. It was Brother Charlie and, uh, and Brother Carlisle back there cracking jokes and messing with me. They were the ones having the most fun. And uh, so it's just awesome. I'm just, I'm, I'm loving it. If you got your Bibles, turn to John chapter 6.
Have you ever met somebody that was just the real deal? I mean, somebody that was just the real deal. Like, not somebody that was, you know, pretty good. Not somebody that was mediocre, but somebody that was, like, phenomenal. You know, like, you think you're, like, a good driver, right? And then you walk up and you meet, like, Tanner Faust or Richard Petty, right? And you're like, okay, I'm no longer a good driver. Like, there are, there are actual good drivers out there. Or you think you're just, like, phenomenal, like, wakeboarding or skiing or something. And then you meet somebody that's doing backflips and you're like, I'm really not that good. I can get up, you know? Like, you ever met somebody that was just the real deal? Can you imagine how the apostles felt, the disciples, when they met Jesus? Can you imagine how their lives were changed when they began spending lots of time with Jesus Christ? Can you imagine what that would be like? I'm going to talk about that for just a few minutes, but before I do, let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for all you've done for us. I thank you for this church. I thank you for this opportunity to, to preach here today, Lord. I pray that you'd please take me out of the way and, and let your word be heard. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Can you imagine what it must have been like for the disciples as they got to see Jesus do miracles. Now keep in mind, some of these guys were fishermen. Some of them were just, you know, regular workers. They didn't, you know, nothing special. But all of a sudden, Jesus began picking out a group of 12. And they were there when he did his first miracle of turning the water into wine. Could you imagine that? You meet this guy, he says, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And all of a sudden, he's at a party and he turns the water into grape juice. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Can you imagine as he, they continue to, to spend time with him? One day they see him walking out over the water. Just walking out across the ocean. Like, think about that for a second. When you're out on a boat and you see your new friend walking across the water. At that point, he was in control. He was, he was above natural law, right? He doesn't follow the same rules as the rest of us. He's walking on water. And then he goes a step further. Peace, be still. Now he controls the weather. Not only is he above the weather, but now he can control the weather. Imagine when he's there and he begins to pull out you know, some, loaves and, some loaves and fishes and, and begins feeding 5,000 people with the loaves and fishes. Can you imagine what that must have been like for the disciples. You thought you were something. You've never fed 5,000 people with the loaves and the fishes. Imagine as they, as they saw that man who had the demon, and he begins to throw the demon out of that maniac of Gadara. And wow, what that must have been like. Some say that his greatest miracle was the raising of Lazarus. Can you imagine as the disciples looked on a dead man? He's been dead for days. But Jesus raises him from the dead. Wow. Wow, what that must have been like. Can you imagine the kind of zeal that the disciples would have after watching their friend just raise someone from the dead? Can you imagine the kind of camaraderie you'd have? Can you imagine the, the talks that go on after that? Well, how do you finish out a day when your friend just rose someone from the dead? We've all had good days. We went to Six Flags. We went skydiving. We did some amazing stuff. Yeah, well, guess what? Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead today. Can you imagine that camaraderie, that excited feeling, that, that bond, that, that idea that he's my best friend. He's the one that I love more than anything. He's the one that I want to spend every second with. He's the one that I never want to get away from. He's the one that if I could stay right next to him forever, I will do it. What, a, what an awesome guy. 46 times Christ made predictions and most of them got to see it in their lifetime. Predictions that he was going to die a certain way. Predictions that he would rise again in three days. Predictions that he was going to ascend to the Father. Predictions of the betrayal. Predictions all through the Bible. Jesus made predictions of things that were going to happen 46 times. And they got to see that. Can you imagine that feeling 
When you see another one of the things come true that he says, he said it was going to happen. There it is. Man, I'm never leaving this guy. I'm never leaving him. Sixteen sermons they heard him preach. Sixteen times they heard Jesus Christ preach. You think you've heard a lot of good sermons. You're thinking right now of some of your favorite preachers. You're thinking right now of the, the best sermon you ever heard, the notes in your Bible with a, a pastor's name there. Can you imagine 16 times hearing God in the flesh preach a sermon? The Sermon on the Mount, the judgment and the resurrection, the bread of life, the good shepherd, the sermon against hypocrisy, the vine and the branches. Sixteen times they heard preaching from Jesus Christ. They saw his deity. They saw him do things that no one else could do. They saw him do things that were impossible. They saw him perform miracles. They saw that he was truly God. They also saw his humanity. They saw when he was hungry. They saw when he wept. They saw when he was upset. They saw when he was happy. They saw when he had compassion. They saw his deity, but they also saw his humanity. They saw him fulfill prophecies. He came and was called Emmanuel. The prophecy that he would have a forerunner. And then they see John the Baptist being his forerunner. They saw him heal many people. They saw him be kind to the Gentiles, which was a prophecy, to speak in parables, that he would be rejected by his own. All these prophecies fulfilled. That's my best friend. That's Jesus Christ. He's with me. He's with me. Can you imagine that feeling? If you've ever spent time with someone who was semi-famous and you're like, he's with me. That's my friend. I don't have any, I've never had that experience, but I do have this one story I'll tell you. This guy that I produce a radio show for, we went down to the mall in Atlanta to take some pictures. And, uh, and the security was kicking us out. They were like, hey, y'all got to get your stuff out of here. You're not allowed to do that. And he said, my name's Abby from Real Estate Deal Talk. And they were like, we listen to your radio show. You guys have a great day. I was like, I'm with him. That's my buddy right there. Like, I'm with him. But can you imagine Jesus doing miracles? Can you imagine all these prophecies fulfilled? People have heard the prophecies. They've, they've heard the predictions. They've heard the miracles. They've seen his deity. They've seen his humanity. They spent time with him. They lived with him. They were best friends with him. They loved him. They were used to pen the Bible. They watched him go soul winning. 27 times they saw him lead a person to Christ. Amen. To himself, I should say. They saw him lead people to God. Amen. 27 times in the Gospels that scene. Some of which were them. Some of which were them. How can you, can you imagine the person led you to Christ? They did a good job. They told it just perfectly. But can you imagine being led to Christ by Christ? Can you imagine every, every stumbling block that's in your way, he takes that right away. Can you imagine every, every thought that you have of this couldn't be true, he takes that right away. He knows everything you're thinking. They were led to Christ by Christ. They lived with him. They ate with him. They cried with him. They rejoiced with him. They worked with him. They had revival with him. They changed lives with him. They healed him. They traveled with him. They fished with him. They were friends with him. They loved him. They did everything with him. They did everything with him. Wow, what that must have been like. That must have been phenomenal. Amen. What, what awesome friends they must have been. They did everything together. Man, that must have been amazing. He never sinned. He never disappointed. He never misspoke. He never overpromised. He never underdelivered. He never forgot. He was perfect in every way. He was the perfect friend. He was the perfect friend. It was the perfect relationship. They never wanted to leave his side. Can you imagine as the thousands gathered on the hillside and he begins breaking that bread and feeding the 5,000 and can you imagine those closest to him saying, that's my Lord, that's my Savior, that's my friend, that's my, that's my best friend, that's Jesus Christ. 
Can you imagine that camaraderie? Can you? It's kind of unbelievable, isn't it? It's kind of hard to wrap your head around. John chapter 6 and verse 70. Jesus answered and said, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. In Matthew chapter 26, I'm going to pick up in verse 47. You can feel free to, to turn up. Actually, go ahead and turn your Bibles there. Matthew 26, verse 47. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Jesus called him friend. I find that so interesting. Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And beheld one of them where, uh, with Jesus, stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and smote his ear. Let's jump down to uh, verse um, 54. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that, it, that thus it must be? In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out against a thief with swords and with staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hands on me. And verse 56 is where I'm on focus. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Then all, the first, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. In verse 69, we see now Peter sat uh, without in the, in the palace, and a damsel came unto him saying, I skipped the part, Peter followed afar off. That's what it said. All the disciples forsook him and fled, but Peter followed afar off. And I'm going to skip down to verse 75. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. It is hard to comprehend that all the disciples forsook him after all they'd been through. Isn't it hard to understand that, teenagers? That, that they were so close to Jesus. They did everything with him. They loved him. They were friends with him. They believed him. They trusted him as their savior. They, everything that he had done for them, everything that they had done for him, they worked together. They ate together. They, they were, they everything. They fished together. They were the best of friends. And just like that, they forsook him. I often think what it would be like to have children, but I often get fearful of one of them going astray. It's a fear of mine. What, what if they don't turn out right? What if, what if they go their own way? What would that be like? I feel like it could be much like a youth pastor who would worry about the teenagers that are on the fringe. Much like a pastor who would worry about the church members that are not all in. Much like Christ knew that one of his disciples was unsaved. After all they'd been through. You see, you sit in a good church. You hear good preaching. You get good teaching. You, you're blessed to have your own Bible. You know all the songs. You memorize the verses. You can sing it without looking at the screen. You don't have to pull your hymnal out. You've been listening to the Sunday school stories for your whole life. You know it like the back of your hand. But have you bought in? Have you bought in? I'm not asking if you're here this morning. I'm not asking if you can hear my voice this morning. I'm asking, have you bought in? Amen. 
Teenagers, you know the right words to say. You know how to dress to come to church. Church member, you've got us all fooled, but you haven't bought in. You haven't bought in. It's a scary thought that you could spend your life next to Jesus Christ and just like that betray him. That you could spend every day next to Jesus Christ and just like that betray him. How much more, church member, can you sit in these pews day in and day out and hear the preaching and know the Bible and know the songs, but never fully buy in? Never fully buy in. This room is filled with people just like the disciples. They're saved and they're unsaved. They're real and they're fake. They're believers and they're unsure. They're changed and they're those who are waiting. There are members of this church that will spend their life in this church and never buy in. You say, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? If I'm here, I'm, I'm probably bought in, aren't I? They see 123 kids saved at Vacation Bible School. They see over 1,000 saved at Hell's Gates. They see untold thousands reached by Lighthouse Global Studios. They see kids all over this community reached by Awana and Kid Zone and Bus Ministry. They see millions having access to the gospel through Christian Media International. But they see it all from a distance. They see it all from a distance. They enjoy being a part of a church that has a heart for missions, but they've never, they would never go on a missions trip. They love having a church that has vacation Bible school that leads kids to Christ, but they don't want to be a part of leading that child to Christ. They have every opportunity in the world to do something big for God, but they'll never do it. They'll never do it. They'll sit right in these pews for 65 years till the Lord calls them home, waiting on that perfect opportunity to do something for God. They've seen the miracles of people being saved through media, but they'll never touch a camera. They've seen kids getting saved in Kid Zone, but please don't ask me to teach a class. They see thousands walk through Hell's Gates, but this year they're thinking about maybe just getting a little more sleep. They see the miracles that go on day in and day out in our church. We've talked about how good it is. We got a great church. We got, we got a lot of places to get involved, but there are people who are just waiting on that perfect time. You say, I don't, I don't know if that's true. I don't know that there are people that are doing that. I'm telling you, there are people in this room today, they love being a part of an awesome church, but they just haven't bought in. They're happy to sit, they're happy to listen, they're happy to sing the songs, but they haven't bought in. There are teenagers in this room today who know they should be preaching, but they're not doing it. There are couples in this room today that know they should be on the mission field, but they're not doing it. There are people in this room today that know they should be supporting a missionary, but they're not doing it. You say, why would they do that? I don't know, maybe they're waiting. They're waiting on something. Maybe it was like the disciples who lived their entire lives up to the very time that Jesus was taken away. And at that very moment, they decided, it's time to forsake him. It's time to forsake him. When it's all said and done, there are churches across this country. They're going to have loads of people that could have gotten personal with Jesus, that could have done something big for God, but they missed it. But they missed it. When it comes to the end of their life, there are going to be people that say it was real. The Holy Ghost was real. The songs were real. The preaching was real. The miracles were real. The kids on the stream were real. The people watching on TV in India were real. The missionaries in Japan were real. The building in Colombia was real. But I never had a part in it. It was all real. It was all real. I never saw those people watching in India, but they were bowing their head. They were trusting Christ. I never met Deborah or watching on the stream, but she really did get saved by Jesus Christ. I never met those people in Switzerland, but they really did. 13 of them got saved this week. Maybe it was real, but you missed it. But you missed it. 
You have every opportunity, teenager, to do something for God. You have every opportunity, teenager, to sing for Christ, to preach for Christ, to go do missions for Christ, to help someone in need. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. It's right here at your fingertips. I could understand if you grew up in a church that, that had no outreach, that didn't preach sermons like this. I could understand if you grew up in a country where you didn't know Jesus as your Savior. There are people out there who have never heard the name of Jesus, and some of you could make all the difference. You're so close. You're right here. You could get involved. But every day, people are missing it. You had every chance, but you missed it. You could have been preaching, but you missed it. Your coworker could have been here this morning, but you missed it. That could have been you singing that special over there, but you missed it. I believe that heaven will be full of regret. Hear what I say here carefully now. Don't misrepresent me. I believe that when Jesus wipes the tears from our eyes, I believe that those tears that he's wiping from our eyes are the regret of all the things we could have done for him, and we sat there and squandered it. I believe there are people in this room that really, if they really believed that kids were getting saved and would spend an eternity in heaven, they would have been a part of Vacation Bible School. I believe there are, there's, there are preachers right here in this teen section that would be preaching the gospel for Christ if they really believed they were going to make a difference for God. I'm here to tell you, it's real. You can make a difference. You can do something for God. But you have to make a decision to not miss your opportunity. Amen. So whatever happened to those apostles, you say? They all forsook him. I suppose they went their separate ways, lived out their lives, and died. Quite the contrary. Simon Peter later preached Pentecost. Philip went on to be a missionary and was later martyr, martyred. John was the, uh, uh, he was a, the only apostle represented at the cross. He took care of Mary. He visited the empty tomb with Peter and he was present at Christ's last miracle. James was the first apostle to be martyred for Christ in Acts. Nathaniel was present during Christ's final miracle and later filleted alive for his faith. Thomas was present at Christ's last miracle, believed to have worked in Persia and India, and was martyred at Mount St. Thomas in India, where uh, you've been there before, right, Brother Eddie? In India, they talk about knowing Doubting Thomas. That's where he was martyred. Jude gave his life for Christ in Persia. Tradition says that Simon was crucified. Historians say that Matthew was martyred in Ethiopia where he went as a missionary. And Judas returned his blood money, hung himself, and died and went to hell. You said, wait, what happened? I thought you said they forsook him. Can you imagine the regret of every apostle? Can you imagine the regret of every disciple as they realized that Christ just rose from the dead? Can you imagine spending your life with someone and you haven't totally bought in just like that you forsook him? And don't get me wrong, I'm not bad-mouthing the disciples here today. They did wonderful things. I'm saying, but they, they forsook him in that moment. And can you imagine the regret when they get the news, the tomb is empty. Can you imagine the regret across the earth of those Roman soldiers who hear, the tomb is empty. Can you imagine the regret of all those who followed from afar off? The tomb is empty. Can you imagine those who were closest to him? The tomb is empty. It was at that moment they realized it was real. It was all real. It, it wasn't a figment of our imaginations. It, wasn't, it really was the Holy Ghost we felt in that church service. It wasn't some emotional sermon or some song in the background. It was real. It was real when I bowed on my knees and accepted Christ as my Savior. It was real when that preacher was telling me that he would give his life for Christ. It was real when those missionaries went off to the other side of the world to give their lives for others. It was real. It was real. It was real. 
Can you imagine the regret that crossed every person's face who ever wanted to believe and they never did and now all of a sudden he's risen from the dead? And they all said it was real. It was real. You say, why did those, why did those apostles die martyrs? Because they realized they spent their entire lives with God in the flesh. And some of them never took it as real. If the piano player would come right now, I want to challenge you. You're in a good church. There are plenty of places to get involved. There are plenty of places to reach out to people. A simple track that could lead someone to Christ and, and, and save their eternity from hell. There are plenty of places that you could get involved. Go ahead and begin. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Hit the altar every time a sermon touches your heart. Give to the missionary every time it pricks your heart. There are young men in this room that should be preaching, but they're still waiting. There are couples in here that know they should be on the mission field, but they haven't bought, they haven't, they haven't bought in yet. There are Sunday school teachers in this room that'll never teach a class. There are singers in this room that'll never sing. There are soul winners that'll never put a track in someone's hand. Love every person you get the chance to love. Give to every person you get the chance to give to. Pour your heart out every chance you have. Because one day, there will be people, Christians, that stand before God with not a single crown to put before His feet. They sat in a good church. They had every opportunity to do something. But they missed it. Heads bowed and eyes closed. If there's someone in this room today that has never accepted Christ as your Savior, do not miss that opportunity. Do not miss that opportunity. Jesus came and lived on this earth and died on the cross so that you wouldn't have to die. But if you miss that opportunity, it never comes back. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection where we help you connect to God.